<laughs> like I was helping all these other businesses do what they needed to do and thinking outside the box and like, yeah, let's do all this stuff. And then for my own business, I was like, here's my PDF that shares this thing that like 20 other people are saying the same exact way. And it was fascinating because I didn't gain any traction. Hey, everybody, welcome to the Leveling Up podcast with Brigham Black. I'm so grateful to have a wonderful guest, brand new friend of mine, Taylor Proctor. She's from getgoodatbusiness.com. So thankful to have her on today. We are going to be talking a little bit more about how the ultimate way to blast past business barriers and how you can make sure that this is going to improve your business today, not tomorrow. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great conversation. So Taylor, tell me a little bit more about yourself, your background. What is it that, that you do and why are you so passionate about what, what you're up to? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first off, thank you so much for having me. And I am so excited that we are new friends and honored to be a guest on the show today. Uh, I am, to simply put it, I am a business coach. But I am the type of business coach that is all about helping you get good at business so you can get back into the heart of why you got into business in the first place, right? Like we've all been there. We're entrepreneurs, right? And you're like, okay, now I've got to get good at this and this and this. I've got to be an expert marketer and content creator, and I've got to be an accountant, and I've got to be a leader, and I've got to do all these things. And you're like, man, I really just want to get back into why I got into business in the first place. Now, for coaches, that's usually to work and offer transformation. Other businesses, maybe that reason why is you wanted more time freedom or more financial freedom. Whatever it is, getting back into the heart of why you got into business in the first place requires getting good at business, generally speaking. So that is where I come into play. I help those entrepreneurs get good at business, which is my whole methodology, right? My, I'm, You mentioned it in my bio. I'm from getgoodatbusiness.com. And a lot of the ways that we do that are through a method called I move. Now, the I move method stands for intuition, marketing, operations, velocity, and execution. In my years of experience, I love it. (laughs) Yeah. In my years of experience, there's a million different things you can do as an entrepreneur, and we get pulled in so many different directions and we have to wear so many hats. But if you can get good at the areas of I move, I have found that everything else in business tends to just fall into place and make a lot of sense and make it easier to find the success that you've been looking for. And so we use the I move method through all of that. And you asked for a little bit of my background. So I found the I move method, discovered, built, created (laughs) the I move method through years of experience. So I spent about 15 years in the corporate landscape, but I was what you would call a intrapreneur in corporate world, right? So very often it was, I'd get hired and they'd throw me the keys to an idea or a new department and say, make it happen. And I did, and I treated it like it was my own business. And so one of those was that I was working for a company and they said, hey, we have this idea. We don't have anybody to run it. Can you make it happen? Sure. So in a three-year span, we went from zero team members to 30, from one service offering to five, from one language offering to five and a half. We did Spanish, but we did North American Spanish as well as European Spain Spanish. So five, but five and a half. Uh, Millions of dollars in revenue and all of that in three years. And I even spent six weeks living in Edinburgh, Scotland, setting up our EMEA European team. Way so. In three years, we're rocking it. And all of that was, we went from one client, we started out with one client, which happened to be Google, Mm -hmm. uh, and then built out to another five clients in that three-year period, including keeping and retaining Google in that space. That said, while I was doing all of those things, on the side, I had a call to be a life coach. Mm -hmm. So I went and got a life coaching certification, started my podcast, and had clients on the side while I was running these huge teams and departments internationally, and I was coaching clients. Well, what we found was that a lot of my clients were like, cool, I'm so much happier in my life. This is amazing. Now I just need to get my business on track and everything would be so much better. And I'm like, I have this whole other life that my clients didn't know about where I was literally doing that, helping get businesses on track. And so we had a crossover where I went, you know what, let's blend the 
happiness habits and the techniques and the things that I was doing in coaching and that mindset, that intuition piece with what I was doing in the corporate space. And now I am uh, have been doing it in my own businesses. I own about four different businesses and we do the iMove method across all of those successfully as well. But I found that the marketing, the operations, the growth strategies, which is the velocity and the execution were crucial. But when you tied in the mindset and the intuition, that is when things really took off, fell into alignment, allowed for congruent action. And whether it was in the corporate space or working with solopreneur or small team entrepreneurs, iMove helped them get there. So that's the brief story of how I became the business coach that I am pulling from all my corporate experience, my entrepreneurial experience, found a methodology that works. And that methodology is all about helping entrepreneurs get good at business. I love it. And that's a really great way to start off our conversation, to hear your backstory. And I, I'm curious, what are some of the, the most common barriers that you see business owners get hit up against? And maybe they, they feel like their back's against a wall that, that you're like, man, if you just did this one thing, it would make it so much easier. What are some of those common barriers? So I'm going to go a little bit on the woo for a half a second here, okay. but intuition is the first part of I move. For a very specific reason. Okay. Like we all as entrepreneurs have had a guru, an expert, a coach say, do this and you'll be successful. Mm. Right. We've got people on the live. Like if you're on the live, put it in the comments if you've ever had that happen. You're like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna do this and it's gonna work because this person said it would, or they have the proof they said it would. And so then you do it and to the T, you're like, okay, well, I did it, I did it, I did it. And it falls flat on its face. Hmm. And you're like, well, why, why didn't this work for me? And it seems to work for everybody else. Why isn't it working for me? And it's most likely because it's not an aligned and congruent strategy and action for you and your business. Hmm. So if I can, I'd love to share a real example of the story because I see a lot of my customers fall into this category and it's the perfect encapsulation of it. I love it. Go ahead. Is, okay, perfect. <laughs> so uh, I offer a service called quantum power days. In that service, we go through in one single day and we accomplish six to eight goals and items on a business owner's to-do list. Mm -hmm. So I had a client come and about midway through her to-do list was create a course. Now, typically when we go in and create a course in a quantum power day, in conjunction with the other five things that we accomplish, that includes things like building out uh, landing pages, video sales scripts, drip, e drip email campaigns, module outlines, resource building, video outlines and mapping, like everything you would need. All you have to do is record the video and your entire course is done. And so it's like, cool, we can absolutely do that. So throughout the day, kept on coming up to like, okay, we're going to do our course here next. And every time we would talk about the course, she'd get a little different. Like she'd get a little bit more concave. Her voice wouldn't be as strong things like that. And so when it came down to it, I said, Hey, we're, we're to the point now where we can build the course, but let me ask you, because it doesn't matter to me. I can build courses. I've done that in quantum power days. No problem. Why do you want to build a course? And she said, well, I really feel like I should red flag. Number one, if you're telling yourself you should do something, take a look at it. Uh, and then she said, I really want that monthly reoccurring revenue. Now mm -hmm. as entrepreneurs, we're all like, yeah, Give me that MRR. Let's do this. But I then asked the next question and I said, so let's, let's talk about this for a minute. Could you market this course with excitement and energy and passion for 90 days in a row? Like, are you that excited about this? You believe in it this much. You have that energy, that motivation behind it, that not only the energy to create the course, but to promote it because there's been a lie taught in the world right now, which is create a course and they will come. Doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> You're nodding your head. No, yeah, no way. It doesn't work like that. And so when I asked her, hey, would you be willing? Do you have the energy, the momentum to talk about this every day for like 90 days straight? And she was like, you know, no, not really. Great. Not saying a course is a bad idea, but maybe let's put it on the back burner. We'll put a pin in it. And we'll figure out what actually is something that's aligned for you. So we start talking and say, hey, you know, you're an entrepreneur. You can do anything you want. If you could do anything you wanted, what would it be? And she's like, you know, honestly, I love intimate, small, like group work settings. I would love to do a retreat. Beautiful. Let's do a retreat. 
So we map out everything you would need for the treat. We find the location. We do our pricing and our, our um, profit and loss projections. We figure out what the agendas would be. We do all these pieces. And then we, we figure out that if she sells 10 clients to come to this retreat, she'll make a $20,000 profit on the three day retreat. So now we're talking aligned action and strategy plus profitable out the gate. If she can sell out the 10 spots and 10 is not a huge number. So flash forward a couple of months later, she's been acting and building the strategy, building upon the strategies that we built in her power day. She sells out her retreat. Nice. Boom. Beautiful. Now, the next part of this is, is she's hosted a second retreat. She sold that out plus two extras. So she had 12 people come to that retreat and 11 of those 12 signed up for her next level program, which we had mapped out when we had built it out in her power day. Now I share all of this because when we're stuck in those shoulds and well, everybody says I should have a course and it's not aligned. Now, I don't know what would have happened if we'd built out the course, but I know she had the energy and she had the excitement and the motivation and the love and the belief in her offer of a retreat mm -hmm. and she sold it out and it was profitable. And then she sold it out again and was profitable and now led into reoccurring income with clients on a monthly basis. So when we look at those kind of things to ultimately answer your question, the number one thing that I see entrepreneurs struggle with is they get caught in the, I should do these things, or mm -hmm. this is what people around me are doing. And they take action in that. It's not aligned. They start to feel the energy drain of it. They don't feel comfortable as comfortable talking about it. Then they start to resent their audience for not purchasing it from them. Mm. And then they come back to square one and go, okay, well now I have to try something else. Cause obviously this didn't work. And they feel like it was a waste of time, a waste of energy. And they feel like maybe they're not meant to be an entrepreneur. Oh. And so it's this spiral so first and foremost, it's taking aligned and congruent action with who you are, what you actually want to do, what your clients actually need, and making sure it's partnered with your energy. And in the sense of your energy of like, I am so motivated and I believe in this so much that I'm willing to, and I'm not saying you have to, but I'm willing to talk about this every day, 90 days straight. That's a long time. And yeah. if I can, if I know that I can maintain my energy and my vibration in that space. I know that's an aligned and congruent strategy for me to move forward on. That's great. So really when, when you're talking with a new entrepreneur, it's, is this an alignment with not only who you are, what you want to do, but is it something that you can be passionate about consistently? Cause I mean, anybody can be passionate about something for a week or two, yeah. but that 90 day bar, I think that's a great way to think about this. Uh, and I, I will would, say too, it's not just new entrepreneurs. Yeah. I've, I work with business leaders who are running what I would consider enterprise startups where we've got them to multi-million dollar valuations. And as a leader, it's like, oh, I saw our competitor to do this. We should do that too. And it's like, okay, like, let's, let's take a look at that. Why do we want to do that? Are we doing it from a sense of FOMO? Like, oh, our competitors doing that. So now we have to do it too. Or are we doing it? Cause it's like, Hmm, that's an excellent idea. And if we tweaked it here, here, and here, it really aligns with our brand and our mission. And I'm so excited about it. We can make that happen. There's such a difference in that. And it's not just beginning entrepreneurs, it's entrepreneurs and leaders at all levels. We can fall prey to this. And so it's yeah. so important to execute with ease, which is the E of I move, right? To execute with ease. It starts with that aligned and congruent action that supports the direction, the mission, the vision, and our intuition going forward. Love that. So when, when you're thinking about how you, you take someone from now I've got this congruent idea, I've got this, uh, this overarching vision, and now I want to start putting it into action on an implement. Can you talk to us about what that that process is like, because I mean, it's a little different for everyone, I would think slightly, but there's going to be some patterns. So tell us what that process is like for someone. Yeah. So one of the things that I love to do is we'll focus on the M next, which is the marketing, right? Mm -hmm. Figure out, okay, here's my offer. It's aligned. This is, this is the strategy that I want to take. Now, what does my audience say about it? And so you do that through your marketing. You figure out the language that they are using that aligns with you as well, right? Don't, don't change your personality, mm -hmm. but use their language, have a strong message that solves the problem. Yeah. 
that's the most important thing. I, <laughs> I love this and I hate this at the same time. I love it because I'm like, oh, there's so much room for improvement. And I hate it every time I see it because I'm like, oh, just soul crushing that that's happening. But for example, I saw a post literally this morning from a, a, a company and they're like, what are you, what are you desiring to accomplish and empower yourself with this week? And I'm like, who talks like that? Nobody, nobody sits there and says to their best friend, mm, I'm going to be empowered this week. What do you think I should do? No, nobody, says nobody that. does that. And so you've got to speak the language of your audience. Hmm. And I'm going to lean on the empowered thing because I'm seeing that a lot in the online mm. coaching industry specifically. And I don't work just with coaches, but I work a lot with online service providers. And it's like, hey, we help you feel more confident in your operations. Or if they're a coach, I help you feel more empowered. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean anything. I don't go to my best friend and say, I just want a more empowered life. I go to my best friend and say, all right, this is what I want. I want to move to a house in Costa Rica. I want to drive a nice car. I want to have more time with the family. I want to do da, 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 and have that freedom that leads to an empowered life. And so first and foremost thing I see is, okay, you have an aligned offer. You have an aligned strategy. How do we move forward in it? Get down to the brass tacks of what does it, what problem does it solve? And don't stay in that high level, oh, empowered, confident, achievement space. It doesn't work. You sound just like everybody else. But when you can say, you know what, I'm going to help you discover what you need here, here, and here. Or you can say, instead of feeling more confident in your operations, it's wake up knowing that your business can run without you if you wanted to go golfing this morning. Yeah. Oh, That's totally great. different. Totally different. And so you're speaking to that ideal client. And that can help you build your massive momentum in your marketing. The other thing that I see, and this isn't common in some of my larger organizations I work with, but for those who are the small solopreneurs or small team, what I see a lot is wanting to skip over the M and move to the O, right? So, okay, operationally, what does this look like? I need to build out my full course before I can market it. Don't do that. Work towards your MVP, which is your not most valuable player, although I love MVP awards. Nope, it is minimal viable product. Yes. Work towards your minimum viable product and market it as you go. I have a client I'm working with one-on-one -on -one right now. And when we first started working together, she said, hey, I'm working with business owners to help them through this type of phase. Okay, awesome. She's like, I'm in the middle of building out my course. And I said, go and talk to as many people as you can. So we set a goal, go talk to 40 people by the end of the month. She was like, okay, come back. I talked to all these people. I spoke with them. I shared about my stuff and I realized I don't want to work with that audience. Ooh, great discovery. <laughs> Huge. Because now it's like you would have spent three months building out this course, trying to get it perfect to then market it to an audience that you don't want to work with and an audience you hadn't been talking to, to know their real problems, to solve and speak their language. Mm. So when we look at marketing, speak their language and market the crap out of the offer, the strategy that you're working on while you're building it or before you build it and pre-sell and then say, okay, now I can make this fit. And then we move into your operations mm. because it's such a waste of time. And as entrepreneurs, we don't have that luxury. We really don't. As business owners, we don't have the luxury of wasting time. So don't waste time. Start marketing. Start testing your message. Start speaking their language. See what they really need. Build towards that. And then I love the pre-sell model. Pre-sell and then build it out and say, cool, now I'm giving you exactly what I said I would give you and what you need because you've told me what you need. Yeah, that that's a great balance between saying, here's what I think you need. And here's what you actually said you wanted. <laughs> now yes. let's actually marry those two ideas together. So creating a, a great offer, I think that's one of the, the keys to marketing, making sure you've got the right verbiage and making sure that it is actually solving a problem that somebody not only has, but they recognize that they have it. So what are some of the, the marketing secrets that you've experienced that you're like, if you, if you really can drill down on this, marketing is more simple. Oh, yes. Oh, my favorite. So uh, actually every area of iMove is my favorite, but I love this question because 
What I see a lot of entrepreneurs, small business owners doing is they feel like they're shouting into the void, mm. right? Oh, my marketing, I'm just shouting into the void and I, I'm talking to the same six people, my mom, my sister, my sister's dog profile, and then three people who are already clients, yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so it's like, okay, we've got to expand and accelerate that marketing message. And the way that you do that is not by continuing to shout into the void. And what it actually is, is there's three phases before you make your offer. And most businesses that I see are focusing on phase three and offer. And phase three is building your no like, and trust factor. We've all heard build your no like, and trust factor. Yeah. So, hey, I'm sharing content. I'm building my no like, and trust factor. I'm nurturing my audience. Why can't I make these sales? Because you missed phase two and phase one. So phase one is what I call pre-marketing phase. And that is your lead generation efforts. You've got to go out and there's several efforts you can do, but you go out with your message. That's that marketing piece coming back, right? Mm -hmm. But you go back with, you go out with your message and an introduction to the problem. Okay. So message and introduction to the problem. You go out on podcasts, you speak at events, you run ads, you optimize your website, whatever it is that you can be doing to like the medium of building out lead generation, but you go at it with your message and the problem. So for example, right? I'm a guest on a podcast, the message is get good at business. The problem is you're struggling to get back into the heart of why you want to get back, why you want to, why you've gotten to business in the first place. So that's lead gen effort phase one. That builds out this awareness and this expansion and you are being seen. You're having as many conversations as you can, whether that's one to many or one to one, you're going out networking, whatever it is, that's phase one. That's your pre-marketing. Next phase is valuable resource. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes I see entrepreneurs, they'll have something in this. Oh, well, I have a free PDF. Okay. Nobody is downloading that PDF because you're not doing the pre-marketing. So you've got to do the pre-marketing with that message and that introduction to the problem. The free resource, the valuable resource solves that problem. Okay. So introduction moves to solve, solves that problem. Now it doesn't have to be just a PDF, a template. It can be a quiz. It can be a video. It can be a welcome email series. Like it can be any number of things as long as it's a valuable resource that they can, in exchange for giving you their information, they get that solution. And it introduces the next level problem they have. Mm. All of this builds your no like, and trust factor as you go. Cause it's like, oh, I saw her stuff. I like what she has to say. She solved the problem with this valuable resource, introduced what my next problem would be. And I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that is my next problem. Now I want to learn more. That's that third phase where you're solving that next problem and you're nurturing that audience because now they're in your ecosystem. Right. Biggest issue I see with marketing is that we spend so much time shouting into the void and not growing the audience. And growing the audience doesn't mean followers on social media. Right. You can have 300 followers on social media and if they're all engaged and your ideal prospect slash client, you can make six figures or more with a small audience doesn't have, doesn't mean, oh, I got a whole bunch of followers on social media because that doesn't necessarily mean and equate to clients. But when you have, when you're doing your lead gen efforts and your message and your problem, that's bringing in those ideal clients. You're solving that with a valuable resource, introducing the next problem. You're still gauging the, that they're an ideal client. And then you're building that no like and trust factor. So you can then make your offer and start to get sales. I love that. This is such a great reminder, guys, that we need to focus on building that that trust factor by solving a simple problem. I think sometimes, like I was talking with my, my friend Marianne Heckman about this, sometimes we get way too complicated in solving multiple problems at once. And then they're like, I want to solve that one and this one. And then they get confused and a confused mind doesn't take action. So what if it was possible that we we could actually solve one problem really well prove that we were valuable. And then they're like, oh, I wonder what other problems they can solve. Yeah. I love this one. When, when you can clearly articulate what the challenge is or the problem is, people already assume you know how to solve it. 
Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm curious what, when you are, are creating this minimum viable product or uh, this, this simple PDF that is a lead attraction tool. I've, I've heard people call them like a Mifki, which is a most incredible free grif- gift ever. That's the vernacular from Russell Brunson. But what is it that you found as the most successful pattern of creating those? Is it like a PDF? Is it just one problem? What is it that you're doing that you're like, man, if you just do this one thing, here's the most common way that this is going to add value. Oh, I'm going to be really transparent with you. I can't answer that question yeah, because it comes down to the audience. So for example, um, and I don't have this any longer, but for three years, I ran a paid online book club. Okay. That was one of the things that I offered. When I had looked at my audience, I had said, you know what? The bulk of my audience are going to be auditory learners. I was guessing because I hadn't had my audience in place yet. This was years ago. But I was like, I'm going to guess they're auditory learners. So it makes sense for me. Plus, I love doing it anyways. And I have a background in radio. It makes sense for me to do a podcast. So flash forward, I'm talking about the book club and things on the podcast, all of that. I have people join. And every month at the end of the reading the book, we would have a discussion and people would say, oh yeah, you know, I don't have the hard copy. I have it on audible. And they'd hold up their phone and we'd take a picture of like, Hey, you with the book at the end. And all of us, half the people actually not even half, it would be 65% would hold up their phone. And I'm like, interesting. I'm targeting, targeting an audience who are auditory learners And I'm seeing that reflected in the audience who are now my clients. Mm. So when you look at answering the question of like, what is the best free resource you can build or the most common or would make the most sense? I'm going to say, know your audience. If your audience is auditory, give an exclusive access to a hidden podcast, right? Those like, here's our secret podcast. You only get access if you sign up here. And we have all these amazing resources that solve problem number one that you have right? Come tune in for our secret podcast, subscribe to the secret podcast. Now your auditory audience is like, yes. And it's not hard to also say, and it's video too, right? And now you're bringing the more visual audience, but you can, when you know who who your audience is and how they learn, you can find the best resource that matches that. So another example is maybe they are not as heavy on social, but they check their email five times a day. Yeah. Right. Morning, mid-morning, lunch, mid-lunch, like all the time. So you're like, an email series would make sense. Well, I can create an email series that has me talking on video and it's a video email series. And now I'm matching where they get their content, how they consume it best. And I'm doing it in a video way where they can see my energy. You can see, I talk with my hands a lot, <laughs> right? You can, see, you can see my energy. You can see all of these things. And you're like, Ooh, I either like her or I don't but you're building that no like, and trust factor. So there's not one answer for all of that. It comes back to who is your audience? How do they learn? Where are they spending their time? And can you create something that is in that space that solves their problem, but also makes sense for you? If you are the type of person who's like, please hide me, I hate being on camera, then find another way or break through those beliefs, but find another way that you can still connect and resonate with your audience in providing that free resource. I love it. And when, whenever you're thinking about this free resource, this is just for all my audience, guys, you need to live in your genius zone. Yeah. I think of all the different things that I've done in the past that some of them I'm like, man, that was me trying to copy someone else or mimic somebody else and not being who I am. For me doing this podcast, because I actually really like to interact with other people and do interviews and get to know different ideas and different perspectives. So it's been something that's very freeing, you know, yeah. and part of it is just leaning into my own personality. Every single one of us have different personalities. We may be motivated by lifestyle, by community, by systems, by admiration or proof, whatever it is that motivates you, you're going to show up in the world slightly different. And if we can lean into who also would resonate with that kind of like auditory learners or visual learners, like for me, I actually really like creating infographics. I don't know if you've ever done that. You know, like I I saw Russell Brunson, he, he even, he read a book and then he wrote a one pager note uh, and a visual. And that's. That's one way that you could collect people's information. Yeah. There's so much creativity in all this. And really the sky's the limit. Like if you can think of something that someone would potentially want, the transactions, you've got your business card, right? Or your digital business card. And we're like, we're going to give you something. So that there's a transaction there. And that's setting that precedent. 
So one of the things that I, I would love to hear from you, Taylor, is what are some of those challenges that you've personally been able to overcome in business or a barrier you've been able to break through using some of these different methodologies? So it's really interesting because when I first started out in coaching, it's one of those things where uh, the the cobbler's kids, <laughs> I was helping all these other businesses do what they needed to do and thinking outside the box and like, yeah, let's do all this stuff. And then for my own business, I was like, here's my PDF that shares this thing that like 20 other people are saying the same exact way. And it was fascinating because I didn't gain any traction. But when I started my podcast, I started getting clients without even trying. And that was when I was in the life coaching space. Mm -hmm. Now in the business space, it's fascinating because the podcast still is an incredible way that I am able to connect with other entrepreneurs, other business owners, and see where that leads. But then also I'm able to have these conversations and realize, oh, the number one thing that a lot of my future clients want and need is an audit. They want to know where the gaps actually are because you don't know what you don't know. And so by shifting away from, okay, what is everybody else doing? And just moving into what feels in alignment for me and for who I want to work with, things have really started to, not even started to, they have like taken off in such an incredible way that I never would have had or seen before. And so one of the first things that I did to be able to do this is I unfollowed anybody in my industry. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't follow other coaches. <laughs> and if I do, I'm, I, I'm probably friends with them. And even then I'm like, oh, okay. They're posting about their offers. Don't look <laughs> not because I don't <laughs> want to support, but because I do not want subconsciously to be like, Hmm, that's what needs to happen. Now this person that I respect and admire is doing this thing. So now I have to do this thing and I'm pretty solid and secure in who I am as a person. But even so, like subconsciously, those things kind of start to come in. And I was actually, I was reading a book the other day and it's um, Get Different by, okay. I can't remember his name. It's the same author who wrote Profit First. Oh, Mike. Mike, Mike Michalowicz? Michalowicz? Yeah. I don't know. yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so a very I was reading... Jewish name. I don't remember. That's like Michalowicz <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, I knew it was Mike. Uh, so yeah, I was reading that book and he he shared how he was, hanging out with somebody who he really admired was a successful business owner, did not say names. And afterward they like had this party. And then afterward, several of them stayed later and were like drinking some whiskey or something like that and smoking cigars. And they said, Hey, let's take a picture. And the main person was like, no, 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 we need to hide the alcohol. My audience won't like that. And mm -hmm. Mike was like, Oh, like, should I not, should I not, show if I'm drinking or things like that, because it might impact my audience. And then he goes, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Like, why am I even having that thought? I like who I am. My audience knows who I am. I don't want to have that disconnect in who, who I am and how I show up versus what my audience perceives. I want that to be one and the same. Mm -hmm. But because he was surrounded by these people who he respected and admired, even they did like a, they didn't say it in a like, hey, you need to do this. But his brain went, oh, maybe I need to do that. And then he had to walk himself back from it. Mm. So I'm not saying don't hang out with amazing people, totally hang out with amazing people, but be very cognizant of who you are, what you stand for, what you do in business, problems you solve, your audience that you work with, how you show up authentically, because you do not want that subconscious. Like if you're not catching it, next thing you know, you're like, oh, I got to hide this for my pictures. And it's like, why? Your audience knows, likes and trusts you for you. Don't start changing that. So I love that story because it was such a real and vulnerable moment that he shared in his book that I think many of us can fall prey to. So first and foremost, going back original question here, I'm a talker, I apologize for That's that. Right. Uh, but like going back to the original question, the first and foremost thing that I did that really accelerated my business is I stopped looking at other people in my industry and started doing what I thought felt right and what made sense for my audience, for me and for my business, not what I saw other people doing. Uh, okay, so this is a great a great way to to really tune in on what your audience wants, not so much what other people are offering. Because I've heard from and multiple people, you want to model and mimic what's working, right? You find the models, yeah. but you also, if you recognize what your audience needs and then you have a, a framework that you know is proven, 
then you can just figure out, all right, what's the audit of, of their business that I know I can serve them in this way and this way and this way. Then you're just living in what you already know. I think that's a great, great way to go, go about and it. And I have a story about that. I yeah, had mentioned to someone that I was doing business, I was doing business audits and they were like, oh, so do you go in and like, you look at their financials and you look at this and you look at this and you look at this. And I was like, no, that would be like $5,000 of my time <laughs> in an audit. And I, that doesn't resonate with my audience. And I'm not a CPA like or an accountant. That's not an area I want to do it. We do look at your numbers, but not in that space. And so it was fascinating to like, well, you're looking at taxes. Are you looking at this? Are you looking at this and all these things? And I was like, bro, <laughs> I, I am not, that's not my space. And it's not, and it's not that I'm not educated in those things, but that's not the space I want to be in. That's not the space I'm an expert in. And it was really fascinating because it was like a demand that my business audits fit what they thought they should be. And I'm like, you're not my ideal client. You're not, you're in a space where I'm like, you need somebody to audit that kind of stuff. You need to hire an accountant, an attorney, you know, those types of people to do that. What I excel in is the I move method. I've ate, slept and breathed it for two decades at this point. I know that it works. I can see based on an audit question, on the questions that I ask, where the gaps are so we can find and fill them and build a 90 day action plan and solve that within a three month period. Stuff that people have taken years to try and work through, through my auditing process, I know I can find that. Does that include knowing your entire track structure? Absolutely not, <laughs> right? It does include looking at your marketing, your message, your mission. It does include looking at your operations and what you have in place to help you scale or not scale, right? Depending on where you want to be in your business, what's the vision that you have? How are you executing? What strategies are you doing to add velocity? What's pulling you down? We ask all those questions and that helps me create plans with these clients so that their energy can be aligned and they can take action on it instead of, I feel like I should because somebody just gave me this business audit. So in terms of that, like it's so fascinating to me because I you will have people say, well, you should do this. I'm like, hey, I'm doing business audits on the iMove method. Dude messages me out of nowhere. It's like, well, are you doing this? You doing this? You should do this. You should do this. And I'm like, no. I, I shouldn't, I don't need to, but by all means, please go ahead and make that audit yourself. Uh, but it was just fascinating because it really ingrained, that experience really ingrained in me. I'm like, who am I? What do I want to do? Who do I serve? And what do they actually need? Hmm. And you can fall into that camp when you can stand steady in that camp. That is when everything else starts to fall into place. Love that. And I think a lot of times we get so confused with who do we follow? Who do we follow? Who do we follow? And then you think about the difference between saying, who, who is this leader? And how do I show up as a leader is being confident in what you know. And then you're like, I, I understand that this has social proof, right? Whatever it is, you, your methodology is you use the, I move, move uh, methodology, but you, you choose that. And then you're like, I'm going to stick with that and figure out how I can serve my clients the very best using this proven framework. I think that's a, brilliant way to go about all these different ideas. And uh, it, it looks like if if you could go back and give yourself a little bit of advice, let's say first year, second year entrepreneur, right? You've been doing this for a while, but let's step back a little bit. And you're like, all right, um, Taylor, when I was younger, what, what would you tell yourself that you wish you had known? Hmm. I think the biggest thing is well, I don't recommend following other people in your industry. Hang out with business-minded people. Mm. For a long time, it was just, I would I would really just talk to my husband about my business. And he's an entrepreneur, so it totally worked. <laughs> and he was like, well, what about this? What about this? But then I also found like when I started hanging out with more entrepreneurs, more business owners, started networking to a larger set, I started to see that the mindset shifts right? You stop thinking, okay, well, where do I get my next client? And you start thinking, all right, what's my lead gen strategy? Hmm. Same, similar baseline of that question, but it's an elevated, like operationally sound, systemized way instead of pray and post, right? <laughs> pray, pray, and post. Post. <laughs> pray and post. I hope I get a client today. Yeah. We're not doing that anymore. And so it was fascinating because I feel like if I could go back and tell myself, I would say, get in those rooms so much faster, mm. so much faster. And the other thing is, is really take a look at 
who you are following. I spent years and years and years ago, but in the life coaching space, I spent a lot of time being like, that's great. Take notes. That's great. Take notes. That's great. Take notes and saving posts on Pinterest and on Instagram and all these things. Actually, Instagram didn't have the save feature then. So it was like taking the comments and putting them into a sheet that I never looked at again. And it also made me feel like there are people out there doing all these things and I'm not. And I started to fall into comparison traps as well. Mm. And so if I could go back to my older, younger self, old time self, <laughs> I would say, you know, stop paying attention to all of that. Do you and surround yourself by other business owners. They don't have to necessarily be in your space. There's a lot to be said about what's working in other industries that your industry doesn't do. That's an opportunity. That's a way to be different. That's a way to see like what's happening. And I live and breathe by that so much. So like I have a podcast where I interview business owners and from all walks, all types, all industries, purely for the sake of when we share how we are using like the I move methodology, it sparks so many different opportunities and ideas for other people in their industries and business. I had one guest on where he was like, yeah, I have a, it's, it was $97 a month once a month email newsletter that he sends. And he's like, it's my reoccurring, it's reoccurring. I have a large audience. They love it. It's really high value. I send it once a month. They pay for it once a month. And I had comments on that that were like, that's genius. Like I hadn't even thought about something like that. Mm -hmm. And they were in an HVAC industry. And it's like, ah, like how, how are there things that you can do or apply and repurpose not copy directly because we're not playing that game, but right. how can you repurpose that from other industries? So know and talk with other business owners to scale your mindset up and to see what's working in other industries that you could potentially apply to your own. Well, not following what other people in your industry are doing because then you get sucked into the sameness trap and then you wonder why you're shouting into the void. Mm -hmm. That's such a, a great way to think about who am I following and then why am I following them? Yeah, because sometimes we 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 get too similar, and if we actually share our own stories, if we actually are willing to to think back, all right, this is what I'm doing in my business, and this is what I bring to the table. There's a competitive advantage that nobody else is like you in every single aspect. Like nobody else in, in this industry that I know of speaks Mandarin and Spanish and has a theater background that is doing a podcast. Like I, I love to goof around with language and stuff and that's okay. Like you don't have to be anybody else but yourself. And I think that's freeing. That's one of the things that when, when I heard you say, you know, I don't follow a lot of other people in my industry. I was like that. I definitely do follow people in my industry. And I have noticed that at times where I'm like, man, that's a great idea. I need to, I need to figure that out. So yeah. I need to hear that today. Thank you. I, yeah, you're welcome. I think it's, it's great to, to see advice that, that you're like, that's a seed that, I absolutely am going to plant. Or you could you could hear something and you're like, wow, I'm so glad I'm not doing that because that sounds awful. Sometimes <laughs> yeah. like, you get those those balancing acts of what's something you want and then something you don't. And if we're not careful, we fall into this default mindset, this default. Well, if they're doing it, I'm going to do it. If they're doing it, I'm going to do it. And eventually, even as an entrepreneur, you get stuck in this mold. Yeah. So I grew up, I grew yeah. up doing track and field. Uh, uh -huh. like competitive comp league track and field. Nice. And the very first thing you learn is don't look around when you're racing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so many, I did it when I was young from eight to 18, but it was like, you would, you'd be watching from the stands, cheering on your friends and they'd go look to see where the other people were and somebody would pass them. And it's like, when you start looking around, you lose yourself and you lose the race. I'm going to say that again. When you start looking around, you lose yourself and you lose the race. So as entrepreneurs, we're always in that race. So don't start looking around, stay true to yourself and you'll win. I love it. That's a great thing to little, uh, tie a bow on this conversation. So thanks so much, Taylor, for sharing your, your insights, your, your methodology, all that you do. I, I love your energy and enthusiasm. Thank you so much. How do people find you online so they can uh, continue to interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. So you can find me um, if you search get good at business. Uh, you, you usually find me there. Uh, so get good at business.com on all of my socials. I am also 
get good at business. There's a common theme here. Yes. Uh, uh, in that, so that's Facebook, that's TikTok, that's Instagram, that's YouTube, uh, LinkedIn. You can find me by Taylor Proctor. Uh, but yeah, so you can find me in all of those places and I'd be happy to also add those links to the chat as well. Fantastic. Well, I'm uh, happy to have you do that. No problem at all. Well, thank, thanks again, guys. I hope you like and subscribe. And if you are wanting more leveling up content, keep uh, keep in contact with me because we have so many more things that we're going to keep doing and interviewing amazing business owners just like Taylor. So thanks again. God bless.